Let's start with the introduction first, maybe, and you know, when you started with Luno and you know. Yeah, cool, yeah. man. Thanks for having me. I um, appreciate it. Um, so I first uh, got introduced to to Luno and, and Bitcoin specifically fairly late, uh, in compared to some of the, the other early adopters. Um, I joined Luno in January 2016. Um, I I worked in the finance business rescue uh, space before before joining Luno, and uh, yeah, it, just, it was it was sort of uh, uh, sort of a coincidence when uh, one of the co-founders of Luna at the stage, Peter Haynes, reached out to me on LinkedIn um, via social media and, uh, and, and I, jo I joined the finance team at Luna back in 2016. So, I mean, did all the management accounts, consolidations, and, 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 then, and then from there it just grew, my interest grew um, in this sort of, in the potential of, of, of moving towards a, a global payments transfer of value system that, that's spread across the planet and that's, that's secure and that's um, that's transparent, and, and, and my interest started started to grow, and um, no, from the finance from the finance role, I sort of moved over to the operations side of things, uh, specifically payment operations, um, looking on integrations to make it easier for our customers to to deposit rands or to deposit euros or naira into their Luna wallets so they can buy Bitcoin, um, and then oh, and, and then from there I, I got the opportunity to manage South Africa, um, and, and I'm currently I'm the general manager for Africa, so I, I oversee. South Africa, uh, Nigeria, and then also our African expansion that we're currently busy with. Um, interesting, we, we we actually launched our business in in Zambia on Tuesday this week. So so, so that's something exciting that's happening at Luna, uh, sort of expanding our footprint across Africa. But yeah, that's sort of my very very brief sort of brief, brief history of my involvement in Bitcoin and, and in Luna. So you you're uh, coming from a an accounting background, right? Yes, yes. So I'm a, I'm an accountant. I'm a chartered management accountant. So. So, um, but I mean, I haven't touched the general journal in, in, in <laughs> probably two to three years now. So, <laughs> and, and, and typically, uh, what I find still to this day is still that most accountants can't run their heads around crypto or Bitcoin. Yeah, well, I don't I mean, know how you, you, you made that switch. Um, look, I think easily, I mean, fairly easy because I think I'm fairly open, open minded. So, <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I mean, I mean I, if I take our finance team here at, at, at Luna and, and sort of the struggles we have with reconciling crypto transactions, having six to eight decimals, for example, into our accounting ledgers, which can only accommodate up to two decimal figures, for, uh, two decimal places, for example. So, so from a technical front, I think it's, it's obviously not that easy to, to, to reconcile your cryptocurrency transactions or uh, to write journals for cryptocurrency. In, into your, your normal general ledgers, right? In your mm -hmm. in your accounting software. So so I think I think from from that perspective, um, it's tricky. And and I, I know I've seen some software coming out specifically catered at cryptocurrency businesses or traders to make that reconciliation with the trial balance with the general ledgers a bit easier. Um, so yeah, I mean yeah. I I met I met accountants that if I met an accountant, I explain to them what I do when they hear these Bitcoin things. They feel like it's a little complicated. They just like disappear. Yeah, no. I mean, I think <laughs> accountant and financial financial planners or financial advisors they usually um, try to <laughs> try to stay neutral and not not give any advice in that regard. So, um, yeah, it's <laughs> it's an interesting space. But but I think I mean I think over the past couple of the past year or the past couple of months, I, th I think. I think the level of, of understanding and familiarity with cryptocurrency yeah. amongst accountants, amongst professionals, we're working with, 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 with top legal firms who advise us on certain, I mean, on certain matters regarding cryptocurrency. Other people would ask, like, what is Luna really? Are you guys a bank or what makes you guys different from a typical bank? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. I think um, some, people, some people might see us as, 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 as cowboys, for example. People, people often refer to the cryptocurrency industry as, as the wild west. Um, and uh, I, think, I think we are cowboys, but, but I think there's a difference between, between a bandit, uh, which is a sort of more a, a charlatan um, uh, 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 pushing cryptocurrency down people's throats and then sort of, uh, sort of forcing them to buy it based on the price and, and, and sort of all of those factors. I think what we are doing at Luna is, is we have a mission to, to uh, our vision is to upgrade the world to a better financial system. And that's a very, very broad vision. Um, and and uh, essentially everything that we do in our product, if you look at our product uh, from a uh, usability perspective, um, also things like the, the number of coins that we have or support on our, on our platform, you'll see that it's not geared towards 
building a, a gambling platform or a, right. building a massive trading operation. It's about, it's about upgrading people to have a future financial system. It's about giving people access to decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum um, and, and sort of giving them, giving them the option to literally dip their toes into, into a future financial system. So, so that's our focus. Um, uh, we focus very much on our, on our consumer, consumer app um, on, 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 on mobile that's easy to use um, um, and also as I mentioned we, we have a strong focus on the learning experience right so we're a very detailed and comprehensive learning portal um, we're doing a couple of interesting uh, educational series now with Times Live and with Business Insider South Africa also yeah. uh, we're going to continue this, this learning experience so, so for us at Luna I mean we, we're all about um, giving people the opportunity um, to, to upgrade to up, to upgrade their finances to something that's better than, than the way we're currently doing money. Um, and that is our long-term long vision. Right. So, and when you, when you look at the, the current financial system mm -hmm. and you're coming from the, um, you know, the accounting background and looking at the uh, other people that have stake in those, let's say the Reserve Bank, mm -hmm. specifically South Africa, so you speaking on the other side of say, look, we're allowing people in the, in the future of money or the better way of, mm. you know, transacting. What's the other pers perspective of cryptocurrency right now? Look, so um, from a regulatory point of view. Look, uh, I think it's a, it's a very broad, broad question. And, and I think, I think at, a, at a foundational level, a, a very important aspect about money is the mental construct around it, right? Because yes. we're using money the way we currently are because that's how, that's how we've been taught, right? But that doesn't mean that, that we have to use money in, in the same way that we've been doing that, right? So if you, if you go and read up about the history of money, you can, there, there are very good books. Uh, Neil Ferguson wrote the book, The Ascent of Money. Um, uh, Yuval, Yuval Harari is a sort of acclaimed, acclaimed author. Um, he's written extensively about the history of money. In the British Museum, there's a dedicated exhibition about, about the history of money. But something that, that all of those historians and all of, all of those write-ups about money has in common is that, is that, that, that constant change is, a, is, a, is, is part of the, 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 the history and will play an important part in the future of, of money. So, so um, if you look at, at Africa, for example, specifically, we've had um, Tobin Meki, for example, gave that a brilliant speech in 1996 where he spoke about um, uh, being an African and the African Renaissance and, 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 and which really focused on togetherness and, and, and when you pull resources together amazing things can happen um, for the better of humanity things like um, you focus on things like freedom of speech democracy etc etc um, but but money really is no different right so so we've had a couple of experiments and projects in the past of which I think the most uh, most famous one is the euro, for example, where we've had 28 to 29 countries come together and, and said, listen, let's break down these barriers and, and let's, let's, let's use a, a, a single monetary unit, which is the euro. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the things that that, that that did to things like uh, uh, costs for, um, for remittances, uh, e-commerce costs, fees to, to the consumers, uh, Intercontinental trade that increased by fifty-two percent, for example. That's all. That's all. That's all strong reasons why we believe that 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 the world is due for an upgrade to a common currency, for example. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah. So so from a, from a, from a regulatory perspective, I think it's still challenging because we still think uh, in terms of nation states, we have uh, borders. Um, and, and you have to pay 10 to 20 percent commission on, on cross-border transactions essentially and, and there, there are regulations in place protecting that or regulating that industry um, and now we have a, a currency that, that, that without any single uh, central person's authority can be sent seamlessly cross-border in, in close to, to real time and, and at a very low cost. So I think that's, that's something that regulators are still grappling with at this stage. Um, the exchange control uh, element or side to to these cross-border transactions um, but yeah I mean I think I think the way the world thinks about and uses money is changing um, whether we like it or not um, uh, people are starting to think differently they're starting to reimagine their financial futures um, and and I mean I think we, we can draw a comparison and this is probably the, the most popular one that people use is called the comparison with the communications industry right so our, 
our technology enabled the way we communicate with each other. Our, our technology scaled that process right from um, yeah, from from post to emails, from landline phones to, to WhatsApp phones, and and we think that the decentralized cryptocurrencies like like Bitcoin um, can can uh, can help money to catch up with other information systems. Yeah. Yeah. So why are we still on yeah. the regulation? So yeah. if give me an example, if you're in South Africa right now, mm. you buy Bitcoin. Uh, I know you guys do KYC, yes. which some people in the, the Bitcoin maximalist. Find it find it problematic because they, they think it has to be uh, you know mm -hmm. uh, anonymous and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, what are does so you are regulated almost pretty much as a bank almost. Look, yeah, because so you you have to do your identification and the proof of residence and stuff. So currently, currently there there are no um, legal requirements on Luna to to do that. We self regulate and 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 so does many oh, other okay. many many other of the more legitimate cryptocurrency exchanges or platforms across the world self-regulate, right? Because uh, I think firstly, it's the right thing to do. We need to ensure that, 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 that this environment and that our platforms, our platform is, is, is safe for people to use, right? So, so we, we need to try and, and eliminate and, and, and keep all the, the bad actors out. And, mm. and, and that's why we self-regulate. But, but also, we, since we've been self-regulating since 2013. So, so we, we're following the, the same guidelines and processes as traditional financial institutions, right? With regards to, you mentioned, know your customers. So that's a process whereby new customers must provide their ID documents and, and proof of address, for example, before they can actually open an account with Luna. Um, the only difference is, is that we don't have the brick and mortar stores, right? So, so the, the entire process is digital and, and, and an account can be opened within two to three minutes, essentially. So it's a very seamless process. But the reason why we, we self-regulate is because firstly, as I said, uh, we need to ensure that our platform is safe for people to use. Um, secondly, we anticipate that regulations will come into play in the future. Um, so, so sort of having that proactive, uh, sort of proactive mindset will really help us <laughs> when regulations come into play to not reactively go and, and KYC two and a half billion customers, for example, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and and then thirdly, it's 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 the right thing to do. I don't think cryptocurrency in the next ten to twenty years will completely replace the, the, the current financial system so, so so banks and cryptocurrency platforms will coexist for the next couple of decades even um, and what we are building is we're building a bridge between the current financial system and, and, and this future financial system that we've spoken about um, and, and in order to build that bridge and in order to, 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 to give customers the option to participate in this new, new economy essentially um, we, we are very dependent on bank partners right mm -hmm. bank partners payment service providers and, and unfortunately, because of regulations that's being imposed on them and, and because of uncertainty in the market, um, a, a requirement on us is to, 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 uh, to KYC and to know our customers, right? So, so, so that's just yeah, part, of the process. part of the process. Yeah. And, and then have you ever been approached by SARS or have you ever had, do you have stories of your customers that they had to deal with SARS and stuff and how do they personally perceive that? Yeah, look, so SARS, it's a good question around the taxes. So, so SARS issued a, a circular or a, or a statement, law, I think it was last year, March or April, where they, um, the, they said that, that the taxpayer should apply normal um, or should, should apply the existing tax act to the cryptocurrency transactions, right? So, so if they trade cryptocurrency, then it must be included in the, the relevant way. So it must be included as tax, a part of taxable income, your your, your 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 proceeds and your your um, your cost must be included as as stock essentially right so it's it's trading stock but okay. but but then again if you if you invest and, and your intention is to uh, to hang, to hold on to your 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 cryptocurrency then then capital gains tax comes into play right um so so and so, and, and if you bought seven years ago no well then then <laughs> well if you if you sell your cryptocurrency now you would you would definitely incur a big uh, there will be a big capital gain. Um, okay, so let me give you an example. If yeah. you were living in Uganda yeah. uh, 10 years ago, and, but you bought Bitcoin eight, 8 years ago when you were there, and now you're here, how does that, <laughs> how does that Look, I think, I think that's the questions that we need, we need answers to. Um, I'm not sure exactly how I've been the, how the location uh, as well, but I mean, potentially you would have to, to pay, to pay capital, capital gains tax on the, on the gain if you, if you had to sell your cryptocurrency now in South Africa. Right. Um, but yeah, so... so uh, 
we um, we are not currently. I mean, we don't currently have any legal obligation to to provide SARS with with customer information, and, and, and we're not doing that at this stage. Um, but but what I can say again, it's I mean, it, it's it's the right thing to declare your taxes, right? I mean, if you if you realize gains on your on your cryptocurrency um, investments, then I mean, then then I think it's the right thing to declare those to SARS. Yeah. Right. And where do you see Luma in the future? Uh, we have seen what Coinbase is doing. They're turning some custodial services there, yeah. uh, which I think they might end up becoming a bank, looking at how the US regulations is going towards. I don't know if you guys are, do you think you're gonna go towards those lines? Look, yeah, I mean, I think I think currently our focus pretty much, I would say 80% of, of our focus currently remains on our consumer wallet. Um, and, 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 and building a really easy to use and, and, and seamless application that the people can can use. I think, as, as we as I said earlier about the, the level of sort of uh, education and, and familiarity, it, it's the, the level of familiarity specifically amongst South Africans about crypto is fairly high. But but people don't still don't, don't understand the risks um, of of cryptocurrency and and so so so, so I think the the challenge still and we're, we're we're at the early stage of this right. I think. We we see the sort of the, this evolution playing out over three stages. Firstly, the, the asset the asset phase, then the transaction phase, and then sort of the decentralized phase. I think they're currently fairly early still in, in the asset phase. So 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 people people tend to be fixated on future use cases and and, and try and front run front run innovation by trying to solve problems that that that, that we might have in, in 10, 15 years time. Where I think currently the biggest issue is. Is, is educating people about cryptocurrency from a grassroots level. Yeah. So, so, so I would say probably eighty percent of our time still goes into, into, into building that that that, that user experience and, and and creating a sort of uh, educational reach experience, um, and and then also expanding our product offering to to more markets. Right. I mentioned. I think I mentioned earlier that that we launched in Zambia on, on Tuesday. So, so taking cryptocurrency to to more people across the African continent, across Europe, and across Southeast Asia. But then also 20% of our time, I would say probably at this stage, we, we started to look at, at, at other options, uh, partnerships. Um, I mean, simple things, for example, uh, a while back, uh, a couple of years back, we spoke to a media company um, specifically around paywalls, right? So if you go into the Financial Times and you want to read an article, that, that annoying notice pops up. You have to pay $1 and then you have to enter your credit card details and your address and all of that. Yeah. Uh, it's really annoying and obviously you don't want to, to have your details, your credit card information sitting on each and every website, right? So so, so something as simple as having an option on a media media site and, and just tapping the Bitcoin or the Luna logo and you, yeah. and you go through that paywall. Um, and at the time that they, they said, listen, it's a, it's, a, it's a great idea, but um, how many customers do you have, right? And, and we said, okay, at the time we think about 20,000 customers, they said, listen, okay, there's no, it's a great idea, but yeah. come back to, uh, come back when you have like a million, two million customers. And, and we, we now have two and a half million wallets uh, across, across all our, all our countries. So, so I think the time is right. And that's why we are starting to spend a bit more time on, um, on new business opportunities. So we are currently expanding our Luna for business platform. So, so we're busy streamlining and building a, a, a sort of better experience from a, from a business account, so 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 people can can can, can open business accounts if you know. Um, in future, I mean, we've we discussed earlier also, but we had an OTC disk back in twenty sixteen. So so those are things that we are looking at, sort of going forward, not in the short run, but but things we're starting to think about, um, and also building out our exchange product to something a bit more robust for the traders that they can. Oh yeah, you know. <laughs> as a trader, I relate to that. Yeah, I, I want I need stop or stop losses and stuff. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so from <clears throat> What you have said, you, you you don't really focus on having as many coins as you know as possible, like any other exchange out there. Do you think that puts you in a position um, with competitors where they can pretty much take some of your market out? Well, no, I mean absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I think definitely, definitely. I mean, I think in sense of Africa specific, specifically, we have a couple of other exchanges focusing on 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 supporting as many coins as possible mm. whereas we took the, the approach to, to 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 support bitcoin and ethereum which is but i have to say though your platform is pretty smooth than all the exchanges that i've used that have many coins there's so many problems out there no look it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a constant process to to improve that and, and to to make the onboarding so so the, the onboarding process a bit easier um and all of that, and and also the deposit methods, right? People need to be it needs to be easier to to get rands into your Luna wallet. 
And those are all things that we're currently working on. But to answer your question around the coins, so, so I think probably one of the most important reasons why I have not added 10, 20 different coins is the complexity, right? Uh, not only from a technical perspective of, of actually adding those coins and, and building custody solutions for, for, those, for those coins, mm. but also from an from a, from a industry and, and a customer education perspective, right? So I think people are still struggling with, with, with understanding Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, so, so, so now by adding five or six new coins to our platform, we're increasing, increasing that complexity and, and, and now the average person on the street is confronted by, I mean, which of the six coins do not support must on our bar, right? And and we have to, yeah. and 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 we have to, we have to to um, to train our our customer support and customer success teams to now know everything, understand everything about six coins to be able to provide customer support in those. So so right. so not only from a security perspective and, and technical, but also from the <laughs> increasing the complexity to our to our consumers. But we're not Bitcoin maximalists, we're through the maximalists at this stage. We're all constantly assessing new options, new coins. And we have a certain criteria that we use to, to assess new coins. And, and when we feel the time is right, um, we will definitely support, support new, new coins. And I think, yeah. I can, I can relate to what you're uh, saying. I mean, I do peer-to-peer -peer and OTC mm. here. So I get, so in Africa, the most used wallet is blockchain. Mm. So if I'm selling in countries like Malawi, and blockchain has so many cryptos out there. It's like I 60% of my customers who are interacting with Bitcoin for the first time, they give me a wrong address because they usually take a Litecoin address yes, first yeah. or an Ethereum address. So yeah. you, you actually arrive on the customer side uh, point of view. And wh why did you have a NetBank account? NetBank account? Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, no, no particular reason. I think um, you obviously have your yeah, FNB and Standard Bank bank accounts. I think. Yeah, it's 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 more a it's more a case of internal resources and prioritization of. I mean, we. <laughs> I would love to have a lead bank bank account and have it integrated, um, but uh, I also <laughs> I have to compete with with country managers in in Europe and and Southeast Asia for integrations. They they also want their bank accounts being integrated, for example. Right. So 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 I think uh, I think I think the important the important um, message is it's important to have redundancy, right? So to have multiple bank accounts and to make it easier for people to deposit money. So obviously same bank transfers reflect instantly, for example. Um, but also in case, I mean, we've had many occasions where the bank application is offline for, for a couple of hours or where there's any technical hiccups um, and then customers must still be able to deposit funds, right? So, yes. so it's, it's having that backup so, so there's no interruption in operations. But yeah, I mean, it's, well, um, it's just a matter of choice. Just a matter of choice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, without wasting too much of your time. So, for a lot of traders or Bitcoin maximalists or those who have been in crypto for a long time, things like the forks is something that they care a lot about because if they're having their coins on Luno, you know, they want to have the, mm. the forked coin out of it. I don't know who made those decisions from your side and how do you assess to actually come up with a final conclusion of what to do or move forward? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And, and we, I think actually we have a detailed blog post uh, around our thinking process behind that. Um, we supported the Bitcoin Cash or the Bitcoin the Bitcoin fork. So so customers had the option to to withdraw their Bitcoin Cash coins, and I think for a limited period people could also sell their Bitcoin Cash on Luna for hands or for, for Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, so again, same with the same rationale for as as with adding support for new coins. I think the same applies to um, to supporting forks, right? And it's 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 not a case of Luna taking those coins and, and using it, right? Uh, technically, the coins are still there, but we need to allocate significant resources, um, engineering capacity, uh, uh, our sort of yeah, developers to to build the infrastructure to support to support those articles, right? So 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 again, there's a security element uh, to it. Whether there's sufficient traction um, or support for that for that coin. Um, so, so in future we may decide to, to sort of to build that infrastructure and then people will have access to their coins, right? But, but at this stage, um, it, it, it's also around customer demand, right? So if there's a small fraction of your customers, 5% really understanding this fork and knowing what it is, versus 95% of your customers really wants a safe platform mm. um, and wants a platform that's safe and, and easy to use, then, then you need to listen to your customers and not allocate resources. I'm not saying we won't ever do it, um, uh, but but you also need to listen to your customers and, and sort of work accordingly. So. And one thing um, that comes out a lot from people that are just getting mm. started and you recommend a wallet for them, mm. the question they, they would usually ask is that, oh, so if Luna had to get hacked, 
Uh, do I lose my money completely or how are you? Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a very good question and I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So, so we use, like, like, like many of the other reputable exchanges out there, we use a, a cold storage hot wallet storage system. Right? So in simple terms, um, we store the majority of customer funds we store in a deep freeze or, or cold storage process. So, so what that means is it's, it's not connected to the internet. Um, all those private keys we store offline. In physical physical bank vaults across three continents mm. um, and it's not as simple as one director going to any of those vaults and just retrieving and spinning those keys right it's a process you need or you need all three continents to come together to put together a third of, of a private key essentially and only then can you can you really spin it so 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 um, it would have to be uh, almost a third world war for before people to, to really get access to more than 95% of customer funds, right? But right. Then, then we have a hot wallet, right? And, and we use that to process customer withdrawals and that's connected to the internet, right? Yeah. But what we do there, I mean, we have very sophisticated internal internal controls around around the access to that. And we also use BitGo as a, as a multi-signature partner, right? So, mm. so BitGo must, must, must co-sign any Bitcoin transaction that, that leaves our platform. Um, and then we have certain certain safeguards in place should should there be attempts on on the art wallet, wallet. But but I mean as I said, it's really only a tiny percentage of total customer funds that that sits in the in art wallet. Do you then? I think let me just jump to this question. Actually, do you have you realized that in Africa it's easier for people to understand Bitcoin than in developed countries i don't know if you i mean i think in africa people people really think about the use case i think specifically maybe around payments right because of yeah. the challenges people have in africa getting access to us dollars which is which is still king in, in in many african countries so and we're seeing that in nigeria for example where we operate people buying crypto um for for payments for remittance purposes right yeah uh, uh, so in south africa we a research indicated last year that, that around 80% of people buy cryptocurrency for investments. But in Nigeria, that figure was slightly different. Yeah. So, so, so businesses and, and individuals buy Bitcoin for, for the ease of doing business. Exactly. Right? They don't um, even know what HODL is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's just an easy way to move money. Uh, easy and, and sort of easy and secure and, and, and cheap way of, of moving money uh, across a global network. So, yeah. So what's coming up for Luna in 20, uh, 20, 2019? And if the market goes bullish do you experience a different type of uh dynamic that you have to deal with that probably would change your your roadmap or look look i think <laughs> if the market becomes bullish i think it's it's actually nice because it, it gives us a breather to, to really work on on the important stuff um so in early 2018 after the crash the, the volumes did the 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 drop a bit um, and it, it, it gave us some, some time to, to build more robust custom onboarding processes to improve our custom support, which, I mean, at the height of the, the bull rally uh, or the bull run in 2017, I mean, even our developers and everyone had jumped in and did onboarded customers and did KYC and did yeah. customer support just because of the, the volumes that we dealt with. But, but, but I think we are in a much better position now. Um, we, we've, our team's grown from, from early 2018 from a team of 80 people to a team of 240 people currently sitting across three continents. Um, we opened our Johannesburg office last year, uh, which, which we're building out as our African headquarter. Um, things to look out for in 2019 is, is, is more country launches. So, so we're launching Zambia, we, we're launching hopefully in East African countries over the next three to four months. Um, we are expanding across Europe, so, so we have a focus of, of expanding and localizing our product across, across countries in Europe. Um, we are looking to reactivate or, or relaunch our, our Malaysian Malaysian market, mm. um, and uh, yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, we're working on a couple of interesting projects from a new business perspective. So outside the Lino Wallet partnerships, potential partnerships where um, we can we can expose more people to cryptocurrencies through partnerships with with um, with financial institutions. And, and cards, do you, I mean, the, the new thing in crypto right now is offering cards from exchanges. Yeah, right? I mean, that's an, that's, an, that's an interesting one. I see Coinbase recently launched their the card. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think um, I think making it easy for people to spend cryptocurrency, I think, is, is important. Um, I think a couple of things. So, so firstly, there needs to be customer demand. So we'll certainly uh, sort of test the demand amongst our customers. And, and if it's something that will only be of value to a, a small sort of, or, or, or only have a marginal impact on our customers, then probably I would say we probably won't launch that in the, in the, in the short run because, because it won't be of use to the majority of our customers. It's a nice to have and a, and a, and a, 
and a value add. But but I also think that we're currently still in this asset asset phase where people buy cryptocurrency for investment purposes predominantly. But but there's a tiny percentage of people that that will start to use it for for payments, right? And and I think that's important as you mentioned, other cards and making it easier for people to spend to spend their crypto. Especially when, when you hold crypto and you travel. You know, yeah. you just you sometimes just want the card and Yes, yes, yes. So so I mean yeah, I mean as I said, we'll assess the, the demand for that and, and, and then but but it's definitely something that, that, that our new business function um, will be looking at. On, on your first day at Luna, <laughs> uh, walk me through that day. How was that like? Um, so I arrived at the office, um, I got my, my new MacBook so it was the first time I ever worked on a Mac, so that was a that's I think that's a perk that that that, that sort of that 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 the the tech and the the fintech industry offers the so to work on cool on on, on cool uh, on cool equipment and stuff. So, so during those days, it used to be <laughs> you used to be Bit BitX, right? BitX, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was BitX. So so we we were in a tiny office in Long Street in yeah. uh, in, in, in in Cape Town CBD, um, literally uh, next to next to twenty to seven. Um, 10 people in the office, um, half of them, half of the people that the customer support um, and, and the rest work by pretty much across functions. So um, my first day at Lino, um, I remember I, I had to help with month in accounting and, and reconciliations and stuff, but I also ended up doing some compliance work, doing some on onboarding customers, so, so checking all the documents and, and, and verifying that. So it was a, it was a, mix, a mixed bag of things, but yeah, very, it was very exciting. And uh, How many customers did you have at the time? Sure, at the time, I think 10 to 15,000. Mm, yeah, okay. and that was early 2016. So, and then, yeah, I mean, currently we, we have two and a half million. million so customers. when did you... Uh, went to the Luna way, and what does that? What does Luna mean? So, good question. So, so we decided to rebrand our business early twenty seventeen, um, and so a bit more sort of background to 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 the name. So, Luna Luna uh, means moon in Esperanto. Esperanto is a fairly new or young language that uh, um, was initially um, created to to become a universal language. It, it didn't really happen. I think. I think. The adoption of the language was was that I, but but who, who created it? Uh, it? it's a it's a it's a I think it's a dialect of, of Spanish. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So 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 Luna means moon in Esperanto. So so firstly, um, there's a saying in the cryptocurrency industry. Uh, I think as you would know, uh, uh, specifically referring to the Bitcoin price going to the moon. <laughs> so so that's the one element. The second element is more linked to Esperanto, which was which is this global future language and, 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 and same with, with Luna and with cryptocurrency being having the potential to, to break down barriers and unite the world and, and becoming a sort of a global reserve currency. Um, and, then, and then thirdly also um, sort of thinking of, of the moon as this concept where you, where you can, when you reach that point, where you stand and you look back to the rest and the, the redundant financial system and, mm. and um, so, so there's a lot of meaning behind that, but but then also, I mean, it's it's a it's an it's a it's an easier word or, or a name to build a brand around. There's there's much more that you can do from a yeah. visual perspective and, and from a creative perspective, right? So so that will also make it a bit made it a bit made the decision a bit easier. Yeah. But X but X referred to Bitcoin exchange, right? And we okay. weren't bu really building a, a Bitcoin exchange purely, right? We were building a. a yeah, you know, a new way of thinking about money and and yeah. You know, so, uh, well, what have you thought then? I mean, in terms of, on average, how long does it take you to get a customer to get a, at least an average understanding of what Bitcoin is? <laughs> um, I mean, I think most customers buy Bitcoin for investment and 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 they see it as a as a commodity basically without mm -hmm. really understanding that that it it's a it's a it's a global. Um, it's a global decentralized transfer mechanism um, without any central form of authority, um, and I, th I think it, 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 it takes a lot of people to understand really the uh, the different use use cases of Bitcoin, and we we, we often try and explain it to to uh, to customers um, by by saying it's it's a it's 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 similar to gold, but but people often refer to it as digital gold because it has same characteristics as, as gold, but it is also a payment system, right? So, so people often tend, tend to, to then understand the sort of the concept and sort of if you make it, if you, if you apply it to a real world example, right? Yeah. Um, but, but I mean, as I said earlier, the, the education part is extremely, extremely important and, and we're putting a lot of emphasis on that at this stage. Um, 
to continue that learning journey post the people buying Bitcoin for the first time, to continue the learning experience, which I think is very important. Yeah. So how did, it, how did you end up becoming the, uh, the country manager and what, why do you think um, you got that role? So, so, so I mean, in the early days, uh, when I joined the finance team, I ended up uh, doing a lot of work on Nigeria. So, so I mean, I traveled to Nigeria to meet with our bank partners. Um, we hosted our first ever meetup in Nigeria back in 2016, and, and sort of I, I was in charge of, of 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 hosting that meetup. And and I think because of my my dealings with Nigerian regulators and banks, and also in South Africa from from an early stage, even though I was in the finance in the finance function. Um, I think because I had those connections and, and, and because I had a bit more experience working in Africa, um, I think that you know, that was one of the reasons. And, and also, I, I mean, as I said earlier, I, I, I have this accounting background, but, but I, I never, never saw myself as becoming an accountant, right, or doing, right. doing uh, accounting work for the, for the rest of my life. So, so I was always on the lookout for, for a new challenge. Um, and, and, and I mean, I was, you know, I was really keen to take up this opportunity when it came my way. Um, but why did you study accounting? Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it was probably, uh, I won't say a safe bet. I don't want to, I mean, I'm not someone for, for falling into a comfort zone, but, but I mean, at the time I wanted to become a chartered management accountant or, or work in finance, right? So, and also had aspirations to do my MBA and, and not, not to work in a finance function, but, but to, to run a business, right? So with becoming a CEO or CFO uh, down the line. Um, so I think that's also why I enjoy this opportunity. A lot, um, and and I enjoy the added responsibility of managing a region or managing a country because um, because of the experience that I'm that I'm going through is absolutely yeah. uh, amazing, and I'm forever grateful for you know for giving me that opportunity, right? Um, so 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 now I'm really excited about building Luna across Africa, um, taking Luna to Zambia, and, and building out that business there, and also launching in East Africa, which I think will be a big challenge, um, and but it's something that that we're very excited about. Yeah, I'm really excited with uh, about what crypto or Bitcoin is allow already allowing people to do in Africa in terms of uh, doing business. It's, you know, it's it's opening a lot of doors for trade and just exposing people to the global market. Yeah. Obviously, with the education, I think st we still need a lot of it because there's a lot of bad actors in the space. No, definitely. Uh, at least in, in, on your platform, it's it's a lot harder for them to work around it. But still, then you still have you know the other platforms that are just open to those kind yeah. of things. So no, look, I, think, I, think, I think if you look back over the past five years, uh, if, you, if you take the risks and I mean, those are the various use, so money laundering, uh, or, um, volatility in the, in the crypto price, uh, scaling issues that we're experiencing in education, and, and you look back over the past five years and you look at, at all the mitigations that we've built as an industry, as a collective that mm. we've built or put in place, just over the past five years, um, from a money laundering perspective, it's becoming much easier for, for, for crypto companies to, to monitor cryptocurrency transactions on the blockchain and, and um, uh, we have great examples of instances where we use technology like Chainalysis and Elliptic mm. to, to prevent um, people from laundering money. How, or, how does that work? Oh, so so it's, a, it's a technology essentially that, that picks up trends on the blockchain, right? So so if you if a Luna customer sends, sends uh, the cryptocurrency to uh, another known address, right? For example, a Bitstamp art wallet, then, then we would know that it's going to Bitstamp. Or, or right. if, if there's a if there's a dark net hotspot, right? Um, and then, then over time, Genalysis Elliptic would pick up those trends and, and identify that address as, as being as being oh, useful right. illicit purposes, right? So, so so then we have technology in place to to, to monitor and, and sort of build spiderweb to see where people are already sending their money to. So that's one example. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, from a from a volatility perspective, I think the over the at least over the past twelve months, we've seen the price stabilizing to some degree, mm. um, and 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 people tend to be fixated on the price, right? I mean, it, but but if you if you zoom out and you take a step back and you look at it over the par, at the price movements over the past um, the past ten years, you'll see that we've been through twelve or thirteen of these of these uh, bull runs, and then there's a slight pullback, another bull run. But, 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 but over the past 10 years, I mean, the price is currently sitting at, at, at I think, roughly 6,000 US dollars. Um, if you look 10 years back, there's, 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 there's great growth in the, in the price. But obviously, people need to, need, people need to, um, uh, to, to be realistic and responsible and not invest more than they can afford to lose, right? Which but is really important. Have you ever uh, dealt with any of those um, money laundering issues um, directly in any of your, the countries you're operating? 
Um, look, no, I mean, obviously, I mean, we've, we've had cases where we've identified people people using cryptocurrency for for the wrong reasons, right? Mm. Um, um, and what are, what are the, the wrong reasons? No, look, um, if I can think of an example, um, someone being fished, um, so someone being tricked in entering the 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 login details on a on a fake Luna website and then hackers getting access to the accounts and then right. sending that cryptocurrency to another wallet outside Luna, right? So, right. so people being people being fished essentially. Um, we've built we've built safeguards there. For example, customers can now lock down their cryptocurrency. So if you're an investor and you never mm-hmm. used for payments, you can lock your, your crypto down in Luna. So even when you get hacked, the frauds just can't send out cryptocurrency. So right. so people must do that. If you're an investor and you don't trade or you, you don't use it for payments then lock down your cryptocurrency um, but we've had cases where, where people got fished crypto sent out we used our software to to trace those payments and and contact the other exchange and, and, and ask them to put a block on that on that wallet address and then we recovered the funds right so that's one example of, of where the use of technology really helped us to um to recover the lost the lost funds. So the, from the institutional point of view, like banks, yeah. they usually talk about money laundering a lot. Yeah. Is yeah. this something that you're directly encountered? Look, I think I think I think there's a there is a misconception in the market that that not in the market, like in the banking sector specifically, that that the crypto is only being used for money laundering. Sure, these tiny percentage of people using it for for money laundering. Um, but if people don't use cryptocurrency, what do they what use? They, they, they use cash, right? Yeah, yeah. So now you, you have the discussion with, with a financial institution and they say, okay, oh yes, they use cash, but they don't use our ATMs to draw the cash. <laughs> so no, they use the other bank's ATM, right? But the fact is that, that people still use cash. Cash is king and it's completely anonymous. Um, it's completely off the grid, essentially. Um, and, and with Bitcoin, we at least have this pseudo anonymity, right? So, so there's this level of, of transparency where through the use of technology um, yeah. and the technology is improving day by day, we can we can pick up these trends and we can we can limit the impact of money laundering. But sure, yes, it is happening. There's no denying that. Mm-hmm. But to a lesser extent as to what's being reported in the media um, and, and to what's being discussed behind doors at, at banks and financial institutions. Awesome. I think we can end it here. Yeah. Awesome.